This session is sponsored by Turntime Wine Brokerage, supporting growers and wineries since 1973 by providing the best data-driven analysis to create profitable supply strategies and opportunities. Hey everyone, George Christie here with Wine Industry Network. Welcome to our final session of the day for our Vineyard and Grower Virtual Conference, Growing Forward. Now this last session, called Smoke Exposure, A Grower's Perspective. And the focus really is on some of the other things that are being impacted as a result of the fires and uh, the smoke events that we've had to experience, not just here in, uh, in Northern California, but throughout the whole West Coast. Uh, we've got a, a, a terrific panel put together. Our growers are represented. We've got our brokers. We've got a couple of attorneys on the call. And this session is gonna be moderated by Lise Azamat. Lise is a co-founder of Dot Wines. She also brings a tremendous, tremendous amount of expertise uh, and experience to this, uh, to this conversation. So before we hand it off to Lise, just a couple of quick things. Um, number one, please take advantage of the chat feature. Um, it's always our goal to make sure these sessions are as interactive as possible. All of our speakers are gonna be in the chat room taking your questions on in real time. Uh, so take advantage of their expertise and get those questions in. And then uh, last but certainly not least, I want to thank our sponsors. Uh, we wouldn't be able to offer these conferences for free without their support. Uh, so beginning with Comcast Business, Turrentine Wine Brokerage, Enardis, SciTech, and Orchard Right. Thank you guys so much. Uh, you're, you've all been great to work with, and you've been great to work with for, for a lot of years. Uh, but again, we couldn't do it without you. Uh, so that's it. That's all I needed to, uh, to cover. Let's, uh, let's get into the session and uh, I'll hand it off to Lise. Lise, go ahead and take it from here. Thank you, George. Um, yes, I am Lise Asimont, the viticulturist, winemaker, and co-founder of Dot Wines. We're a small family wine label that specializes in Russian River Valley wines. As George had so eloquently explained just a moment ago, the 2020 growing season and harvest posed many challenges and was a sad reminder that wildfires are truly an ongoing environmental hazard for California wine grape growers. The effects of this particular vintage will extend well beyond the vineyard and are changing how we approach all aspects of the wine grape business. Today, we are blessed to have a panel of experts that will share their experiences during this difficult vintage and offer insight through their solutions-based discussions on how we can move forward with confidence and continue sustainable business practices in a dynamic and relatively unknown climate. First and foremost, I would like to introduce Jeff Bitter. Jeff is the president of Allied Grape Growers, a 500 plus member statewide grape growing cooperative marketing association. He's a fourth generation grape grower on the land he and his wife own and operate. He earned a bachelor of science degree in agricultural business from California State University, Fresno, go Blue Dogs, and a master's degree in business administration from the same. Jeff is a graduate of the California Agricultural Leadership Program and participates on numerous industry boards, committees, and task forces. Uh, Jeff, please take it away. Thanks, Lise. Well, um, you know, to get started here, I think what we want to do is just kind of set the stage for what happened in 2020. And of course, we're talking about smoke exposure today because of 2020. But we all know that over the last uh, five or six years, there's probably been more seasons than, than not that we've experienced smoke somewhere in the North Coast. So um, Coming into 2020, there was there's common knowledge that there's an industry oversupply. There, there's no secret. We've all talked about it. Um, we left a considerable amount of uh, grapes on the vine in 2019. And so we, we kind of came in with an, an undesirable situation. And then, of course, the pandemic hit and government shutdowns were exacerbating our situation, particularly for coastal uh, producers. And so many coastal wineries were looking to relieve themselves of, of the contract obligations that they had even prior to, you know, any of the wildfires or issues surrounding the smoke. So uh, mostly they're looking to reduce tonnage, even over, I would say, reduced price in some cases. So um, some wineries were even, you know, kind of attempting to uh, manipulate the, uh, the consequences of the pandemic to fit into the force majeure, you know, uh, clauses of contracts and, and so there was kind of a general push uh, away from uh, supply at, at that point. And then, of course, uh, once the fires broke out, uh, our, our attention was quickly diverted from, from the oversupply and the pandemic to the reality that now we were all uh, experiencing a lot of smoke in the air. So uh, at first, we 
you know, kind of experienced um, low levels of exposure and affected areas were very localized. And there was a lot of talks ab about the proximity of, of the fire to the vineyard. And, you know, are we experiencing, you know, new smoke or old smoke? Uh, is it smoke that sat up in the air, uh, an atmospheric smoke that was three or four days old, and maybe that wasn't as harmful uh, versus new smoke? And so there became a lot of conversations around, around that. And um, as time passed, though, eventually all areas were, were subsequently affected by the smoke in some way, shape, or form, and many wines would end up... Um, you know, testing with, with detectable levels of volatile phenols. So overall, what can we learn from the experiences in 2020? Well, there's a lot of questions and I'm going to kind of throw some questions out now and, and, and then we'll dialogue about them as we uh, move into the dialogue portion of the recording. But uh, uh, really, it comes down to a few things. How do we clearly differentiate between smoke exposure and smoke taint? Uh, what defines taint? Uh, there's really no industry standard. Uh, you do see where there's reference to taint being anything that is measurable, but uh, there's different tolerances for that. Uh, what are, where are the most vulnerable uh, uh, to the negative aspects of the smoke? You know, we are, we are learning with every passing smoke year that there are many differences regarding uh, the grape response to smoke. So where are we most vulnerable there? It, you can't really use standard um, uh, thresholds across all segments, categories, or varieties. So we need to understand where our vulnerabilities are and how that may affect us in, as an industry. And, you know, is it even possible to standardize, standardize um, a subjective evaluation of smoke? Uh, we all know that uh, smoke exposure and, and, and the ability to uh, detect that in wine uh, is something that we can do in a lab, but for consumers, uh, that's not uh, as black and white. There's a lot of science that shows people have varying levels of sensitivity to smoke. So that comes up in conversations. Uh, and particularly uh, as, as it might apply to the winemaker, some winemakers are most, more sensitive to smoke than others. Uh, and then also, you know, are we even measuring the right compounds? Do we know that they're true markers. Uh, are there compounds we don't know about yet? Uh, there's questions ex exist regarding uh, grape sampling and micro fermentations and testing. Are they truly indicative of what the wine will be? Or are we actually identifying worst case scenarios? Are we pulling out all of the volatile phenols? Are we measuring everything that's there, regardless of whether or not that will manifest itself in wines? And so, you know, there's, there's just lots of questions around these things. Uh, free versus bound testing of uh, volatile phenols and whether or not uh, free is a good measure or a good indicator. And so ultimately, you know, I kind of think smoke exposure is no different than other undesirable attributes of wine, whether you're talking about methoxypyrazines, Britannomyces, volatile acidity, aldehydes, whatever. You wouldn't expect winemakers to have the same tolerances uh, for these attributes. So why should we have uh, a standardized tolerance for smoke exposure? Uh, in the industry. And then lastly, we kind of dealt with, you know, crop insurance and and really kind of a, an industry-wide misunderstanding of crop insurance. So as we move forward, there's questions there that need to be cleared up. Uh, growers always should open a claim at the first sight of smoke. That's the bottom line. If there's smoke in the air, open a claim uh, so that you can move forward uh, if need be. And what are the requirements for an indemnity to, indemnity to be paid? So uh, questions around that because not all uh, insurance companies require the same uh, information to pursue uh, a claim and, and pay out an indemnity. And so in recent years, some insurance companies have allowed uh, test results that were not from certified labs per se or from third party labs. They've allowed test results to be used in claims that are uh, from wine versus grapes. And so there's lots of changes that are even ongoing in, in everything having to do with smoke exposure. So as we go through this, um, this uh, seminar today, I, I hope that, that we get some answers to many of those questions.
Thank you, Jeff. That was wonderful. And thank you for opening it up and laying the stage for this all important topic. Um, before we proceed, also want to make sure that all um, those who are watching, uh, please take uh, the opportunity, should you have any questions, to use the chat option. Um, this might be a pre recorded session. However, we are all the speakers here today are live during your session. And we'll be answering your um, questions should you post them on the chat option. So please post away. Our next speaker is John Trinidad. He's a partner in the Dixon, Peatman, and Fogarty firms, wine law business, alcohol beverage, and geographical indications practice groups. John advises wine and alcohol beverage industry clients on a broad range of legal issues, including business formation, obtaining alcohol beverage licenses, and the drafting of key contracts, such as great purchase agreements, vineyard leases, and distribution contracts, and the purchase and sale of winery brands and assets. John also advises clients on federal and state alcohol beverage regulations such as franchise laws, tied house laws, laboring requirements, and the protection and promotion of American viticultural areas. He's a graduate of Harvard College and the New York University School of Law. John, please uh, please join us with your um, your thoughts here. Thanks for the introduction, Liz. Appreciate it. And Jeff, thank you for setting the groundwork. I know that this has been a a challenging year for for everybody in the industry. Um, you know, we get hit with COVID, and all of a sudden, we are looking at what what promised to be a good vintage, and all of a sudden, August rolls around, and um, I feel like everybody felt feels a little sideswiped. Um, so, in in my short um, uh, introductory statements here, I'm just going to cover two different areas. Um, one is, you know, as we get through August and September 2020 time period what were the key provisions in the great purchase agreements that wineries and growers looked at to try to figure out what their rights were um, in terms of uh, grapes that may have been um, damaged due to, due to smoke exposure. Uh, and then second, uh, the second part of this upfront presentation will deal with going forward. What are some things that, that folks might wanna look at in terms of their own contracts as they look to uh, potentially revise them in light of the ongoing threat that wildfires pose uh, to California and the, in the overall wine industry. So first off, in terms of uh, key provisions in great purchase agreements, um, you know, the first one that folks should take a close look at deals with seller warranties and great quality um, uh, provisions. Uh, this could be as simple as a statement that says that the, all grapes delivered will be suitable for the making of quality wine, premium wine, ultra premium wine. And what we've seen in the marketplace is a lot of times growers will, will gloss over those statements, not realizing that they're actually making a warranty as to the product they will be delivering. And that if they don't meet that standard, that allows an opportunity for rejection. Um, I think a lot of people take pride, obviously, in the quality of the grapes that they grow. And they know um, that year in, year out, barring something unforeseen, they should be able to meet those quality standards. Um, but um, I think uh, that's one thing that folks will need to take a close look at. Do they understand what those quality provisions are? Are they going to be able to meet them? Um, and how are those laid out in the contract that you're, you've specifically signed? The next area that people looked at had to deal with provisions around definitions of uh, uh, defects, as well as provisions that laid out how the winery could inspect, accept, and reject grapes. Now, normally, uh, especially pre-2017, almost all of those defect provisions had to deal with things that could be viewed and, and analyzed in the vineyard or at the crush pad upon delivery, right? This had to deal with mog, rot, mildew, things that could, could be easily decipherable. Smoke exposure doesn't lend itself for that in the vineyard or that on the crush pad analysis. So this is sometimes trying to fit a, a square peg into a round hole. Uh, trying to figure out smoke exposure related to defect provisions that were not crafted uh, with the idea of, um, of wildfire. The third provision that everybody looked at had to deal with force majeure. And I think everybody tends to gloss this section over. It's usually towards the end of an agreement. Everybody seems to think that they know what it says. Um, and the shorthand that people take away from force majeure is something bad happened, I can walk away. That's not quite right. Um, First off, in general, the idea of force majeure is that there is a situation outside of the control of either of the parties that has made it impossible for one of the parties to meet their obligations. That is a high bar, the idea of impossibility of meeting your contractual obligations. Now, that being said, that's the general idea behind force majeure. 
but each contract has to be read on its own. So we've seen a lot of changes to the force majeure provisions. We've seen force majeure provisions that are unilateral, i.e. they only let one side out of the contract, not both parties, if there's, some, if it, there's an unforeseen event com that comes about. We've seen standards that are lower than impossibility. So you really have to take a look at this section that a lot of people think of as just boilerplate and figure out what kind of rights it gives to each party. So going forward, what have we... Um, what are we looking at now as people start looking towards great purchase agreements for 2021 and beyond? One thing that, that sounds obvious is trying to create a specific smoke exposure provision um, that is in addition to the regular defect, mog, rot, mildew provision. But this provision would create a process for testing of grapes, would potentially allow for post-harvest rejection, uh, and maybe even allow for price adjustments. So we're seeing a lot more of, of um, of these contracts trying to fold in a smoke exposure specific provision. Uh, we're also seeing folks looking at their um, price escalator provision. So for multi-year contracts, as many of you know, there's usually a price escalator that adjusts the price each year, and that's often tied to the Great Crush Report. Problem has occurred now though, that because of wildfire and price adjustments, the average price of grapes may drop in these wildfire years. Uh, so that may affect future pricing um, if that future price is based upon the, the current great pressure port. So one thing that parties might wanna think about is putting you know, in those price escalators, maybe put in a percentage cap that would, uh, that would put some sort of limit on the upward or downward movement of, um, of price adjustments that are based on the great pressure port. But those are just a few things that, that we see people talking about now and, and starting to make plans as they move forward. Um, but one thing to keep in mind, and Lee's really hit this in the introduction, it's still a very dynamic environment out there. We are still learning about smoke exposure and how it impacts grapes. We're still learning about methods of amelioration in the cellar. Um, there is a moving target on what labs can and can't do and what they could test. So uh, one of the jobs in, in any contract is creating some amount of certainty for the parties. But because we're dealing with a dynamic environment, there should also be some flexibility in there. So it's a fine line between trying to get those two things into, uh, into your contracts. But with that, I'll hand things back over to the rest of our panel. Thank you, John. That was an excellent introduction to your thoughts there. Really appreciate it. Moving on to introduce our next speaker, Brian Clements is a vice president and partner of Turrentine Wine Brokerage. With over 25 years of experience, Brian is a wine business veteran who has worked with small high-end growers and wineries and also with the largest players in the wine business. His responsibilities include managing Turrentine's industry-leading great brokerage team and working with clients throughout California, including the North Coast, Central Coast, and the Central Valley. Brian is an expert in how to effectively balance risks in a volatile market and how to anticipate supply cycles. He's a graduate of Fresno State with a Bachelor of Science degree in plant science and viticulture. Brian. Thanks, Lise. It's great to be here today back at uh, when talking about uh, smoke exposure and certainly a timely, a timely subject. And I'm sure that at the end of 45 minutes, we'll, we'll answer all the questions. It'll no longer be a, be a problem. So as, as you know, Jeff alluded to a lot of things here and, uh, you know, 2020 uh, for most of us was, was uh, one of the most difficult years, at least of my 30 years, was one of the most difficult years that I experienced in the wine business. We had fires burning from August to October throughout the state, certainly putting uh, hundreds of thousands of tons of grapes at risk uh, in the North Coast. Um, certainly when we had the, the early fire in August, the uh, lightning complex fire, the early red varieties were affected. And then we had the glass fire that started in September, um, certainly put uh, uh, the later reds at risk as well. And we had thousands of tons rejected in, in, in the North Coast. Um, and and th those, the smoke from those fires put the whole wine business in chaos. It put the wineries in chaos, the growers, the labs, more importantly, the brokers. And again, it led to thousands of tons of, 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 of rejections uh, in the North Coast. And, and certainly we know the rejections across California and the Central Coast. Um, and there's been questions and comments about, you know, how did, um, did the market play a role in the 2020 vintage, uh, vintage? And, you know, when individuals like me try to answer those questions, it's like we're dancing on a landmine. Um, so if my video feed suddenly gets uh, cut, 
that just means that I'm not a very good dancer. Um, so I'm going to try to answer that. And, and the broad answer is, is yes. Um, and balance in the, I've always said for years, balance in the, in the great markets last about 15 seconds before it enters into a buyer and seller's market. So supply and demand always plays a role in the outcome of, of, a, of a vintage. Um, our business, our wine business is at the mercy of mother nature, of the economy, the consumer, and the subjectiveness of growers and winemakers who are passionate about the products they grow and produce to get to the consumer. Uh, the bottom line is every quality, the bottom line is every year, uh, every vintage quality standards are somewhat flexible due to seasonal occurrences benefiting one side or both sides and 2020 uh, was no different. And Jeff mentioned too, when we look at the market as a whole, we have to go back to really the 2017. Prior to 2017, we had, you know, six, seven years of, 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 of great, great markets for the seller. We had records in, in the spot market pricing. We had records in, uh, in, in the average pricing that comes out every year. And in the beginning of 2017, we felt that change and we were going into a predicted oversupply that we've, we've seen the cycle uh, uh, rotate for years now, for decades now. And it's, it was no different starting in 2017. Um, by 2020, there were, there were 20 million gallons, 22 million gallons on the, uh, actively for sale in the bulk wine market with prices of bulk wines gravitating towards uh, Central Valley pricing. Grape, grape inventories are high and contracting had, had, had slowed and, and wineries weren't uh, renewing contracts or they were notifying on evergreen um, uh, notices or evergreen contracts. And when the fires began in 2020, the, the wineries, they, they'd been in these situations before, they came to the bulk wine market and started purchasing 2018 vintage wines to extend their blends. Uh, uh, and over time, because of that activity, the bulk wine market dropped to 8 million gallons. So it was at 22, 24 million gallons, and it dropped to 8 million gallons actively for sale. And that's a, a huge drop in a very short period of time. Currently now we have about 8 million gal uh, 11 million gallons on the bulk wine market and the markets are very active. Um, and when we look at the, the, the great market is in the North Coast, it is active as we speak. Uh, we had a short crop and certainly those rejections played into it. We had a, we had a, we all, we all saw the crop report that came out on February 10th. And we saw that uh, the tenants was off quite a bit from the previous years and years. And so that went into play in the bulk wine market, 11 million gallons uh, uh, actively for sale. What we saw that wasn't delivered or the lack of crop in 2020 plays into a, a market that feels balanced for in the North Coast for bottles of wine that are made to that 10 to $20 range. Obviously, with the, with the on-premise closers continuing to, uh, uh, to go on, that the higher priced wines you know, are, are dramatically impacted by the closures of these, of these places. And that needs to be remedied very, very soon. Um, looking forward here, as far as the market goes, again, it's in that value range in the North Coast where it's, where it's in a, 20, a 10 to $20 bottle range. Uh, we have active markets right now. The prices aren't where they were when, when we had the record prices. But my point uh, in my summary here about the market, it's certainly better and I'm looking at a silver lining here, though the fires and everything that we went through were horrible. But the silver lining is we were going to most likely be in an overage that was going to last five to seven years in different areas of California, certainly five years, I believe, in, in the North Coast. And now we're feeling like we're most in balance again for those for those categories in that in that 10 to uh, $20 a bottle. And those wineries are active after actively trying to uh, come out and buy grapes and get contracts together. In the Central Valley, because of pantry filling and, and, and all that, it's basically sold out. Planning contracts and, and, uh, and grafting contracts are, are available. In the Central Coast, there's more activity than we've seen in the last five or seven years, and prices uh, are on the increase. So there is a silver lining here that the pain and suffering that we went through and the fire and, and, and the smoke exposure and, and all the things that happened in 2020 um, are having a positive effect on the market so far in 2021. Anything can happen. We don't need a big crop, um, but everything feels, at least for that category that I keep mentioning on bottle price, everything feels uh, fluid. We're doing a lot of bulk wine deals. We're doing uh, quite a few great uh, deals in the North Coast, especially Napa and Sonoma, and that should continue unless we get a big crop. 
uh, going forward, as far as solutions, and, and Lise, you and I have talked about this, you know, reading the fires that we've had in the past, I started reading about what they do in, in Australia. And one of the things that they do, and this isn't an answer, but it could be a tool, is baseline uh, readings uh, in, 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 in grapes in normal, se in normal seasons, if there is, if there is, is a normal to an, a, a season. And at least you and I have talked about it, and I'm sure that we'll talk about it a little bit more here, is getting the grapes tested at maybe 22 sugar and finding what the baseline is in a vineyard. So when we do have these uh, uh, these readings like Jeff was talking about, each vineyard will have a baseline and something else to to uh, add to the, uh, the discussion. Um, but 2020 was a difficult year. The markets are improving. And hopefully, again, we'll have a you know an average crop and and continue the the buying and selling of North Coast grapes in bulk wine. Thank you, please. Thank you. That's exciting to have a silver lining. We're starting to go in a better direction now because for a moment there, I was starting to have a little bit of PTSD along with everyone else. <laughs> right, right. So thanks for thanks for coming over the peak there for us, Brian. Sure. On to David Balter. David joined Dixon, Peatman and Fogarty in 2005 and is the director of the litigation department. David's practice emphasizes trust and estates litigation, creditors' rights, commercial business, real estate and construction litigation. Before joining DPNF, David David worked for 10 years at Shapiro, uh, Buckman, Provine, and Patton. And I apologize to all four of those partners whose names I most likely just completely slaughtered. LLP, Walnut Creek, California. David also worked at the Alameda County District Attorney's Office as a collection enforcement deputy and was a senior legal assistant at the international law firm of Kudare Brothers. Uh, thank you, David. Thanks, Lise. Um, so as Lise just explained to you, I'm I'm the litigation attorney. So when things go wrong, I'm the guy that gets called in to try and clean things up. Um, in broad strokes, as my partner, John Trinidad explained to you, there's a lot of room in a contract to try and flesh out as many details as possible about a great purchase agreement and how it should work. And you could spend a lot of money drafting a perfect contract but at the end of the day, it really depends upon the goodwill of, of the people involved. And entities are made up of people. I don't care how big they are. Everybody knows everybody in this business and reputation and your personal um, business ethos uh, means a lot in the wine business. Um, so to begin, uh, if a dispute arises about smoke taint, you would first look to uh, the terms of the great purchase agreement itself to see what the methodology, if you will, for resolving that dispute would be. Some great purchase agreements, for example, have a arbitration clause. For those of you that don't know, arbitration is a private judge court system that you pay for uh, in which that judge or arbitrator or a panel of arbitrators, depending on the scope of the, uh, in terms of the arbitration clause, decide the dispute. Um, it's it used to be in favor. It's no quicker than the court system now, and it's quite expensive. Some great purchase agreements that I have seen also include a pre-arbitration uh, or litigation mediation provision in which the parties attempt to work out their disputes between themselves. I encourage all of our clients to do that prior to any sort of attorney involvement. Um, again, going back to the fact that this is a very personal, person to person based industry. And um, usually a, uh, some sort of a resolution can be reached among the parties. Sometimes when it can't, that's when the lawyers get involved. One of the unfortunate side effects of COVID uh, is that the California state court system, where most great purchase agreements are litigated, has really been uh, negatively impacted uh, for civil cases, such as a, a dispute over a great purchase agreement. For example, I've had um, a dispute over a great purchase agreement in which I represent the grower uh, that is, um, been in court for six months so far, and it probably will not get set for trial until early or mid 2022. And the purchaser of the grapes is aware of this delay and is just holding on to the money and doing as little in the litigation as possible to save money on attorney's fees and costs. 
And that is a, a data point that all growers should be aware of if they are thinking about suing to foreclose on their growers. Um, that is unfortunately right now a very time consuming process. The California court system has a statutory preference to hear criminal matters first and civil matters uh, come in second place. And in, even then, they are not being heard within 12 months, as is typically the case from the date of filing. So keeping in mind the expense involved in litigating a great purchase agreement, I want to go back to something I said earlier about reaching out to the purchaser of your grapes and trying to work something out. We had numerous questions from both our grower and winery clients during the fire season at the uh, end, I suppose, of 2020. It gets bigger every year. I can't even keep straight when fire season is and isn't anymore. Um, and all, out of, I don't know, between 20 to 40 of those types of disputes in general that were in the firm at one time, I only know of two that actually turned into what I would consider litigation. And in that case, those two seem to be driven by underlying factors, such as it was a very old great purchase agreement. I think it was from like 2015, and it just rolled over year after year after year, and nobody looked at it. So it didn't have any provisions that really dealt with the situation, such as the one we encountered in 2020. And both of them, I noticed, were the last year of either an evergreen or a, or a specific term on, on the great purchase agreement. And one side or the other was trying to utilize that fact to, as a negotiating fulcrum to obtain a better result through negotiations. So I would suggest to, to anyone who is listening to this that try not to use the natural disaster, in this case, fires, as an opportunity to renegotiate your entire great purchase agreement or extend the term because it's typically not the right time to engage in those types of uh, those negotiations. In addition, if you have a pre-2017 great purchase agreement that does not specifically address smoke as an issue, I would suggest that moving forward, it's probably time for you to have that uh, agreement revised and either updated, replaced with a brand new agreement would probably be preferable or uh, at least have it amended to, to include terms that would assist both the grower and the winery or the purchaser, whoever that may be, uh, in shifting the risk of these uncertain times. Because as we've seen since 2017, these fires are becoming an almost annual basis. Uh, are occurring on, on an annual basis. And this is something, the effects of, of climate change or whatever is driving this, uh, is something that we're gonna have to deal with on a regular basis. So updating your contracts to, to address that risk, perhaps share that risk is in everyone's best interest. And quite frankly, will save you a ton of money later if God forbid litigation or some form of dispute resolution arises over this type of situation. And with that, I'll give it back to Lise. Thank you, David. Um, all right, so everybody, thank you so much for your beginning thoughts. So everyone give a big stretch, <laughs> twist your neck, let's do this. You guys ready? We're gonna start with a discussion. So I'm gonna put on my, my old lady reading glasses for you so I can see my screen. <laughs> we have actually met a few times prior to this, um, even though we acted like strangers. Um, and there are quite a few, we had a very robust conversation that um, was very interesting and really kind of came to this point of what is our next step forward regard with regards to contracts. And I feel that kind of coming off of John's discussion and David's discussion, contracts, let's start there, gentlemen. How do we see them changing? What is the ideal 
ideal sort of um, uh, uh, ideal form of what the future contract would look like? Is it and a couple ideas for you guys to start on and then let's please just dive in. You know, is it uncoupling from district average pricing, the use of percentage change caps? Is it requiring arbitration requirements, which I thought everybody had. So David, thank you, because that's terrifying to think that people don't have that. Um, how else are we going to try to have a ways for both growers and wineries to share that risk? So who would like to dive in and let's have a discussion about this? Well, all I can say is as the litigation attorney, as the janitor that's called in to clean up these messes, <laughs> um, very expensive janitor, the more detail that's in the contract, the easier it is for me to put the dispute resolution on some sort of path towards a resolution. Um, moreover, the more detail that's in a great purchase agreement about risk sharing um, gives you an idea of what of who you're really dealing. With. You know, if you have reasonable people, typically the provisions in the contract are reasonable risk sharing provisions. Again, you know, I'm, I'm probably repeating myself a little bit here, but it's mostly on the older pre-2017 contracts that we see like a force majeure clause arise and people say, oh, ha, see, it says fire in there. So therefore I get to walk away from this contract. Um, you know, maybe, maybe not, but it's going to be a very expensive uh, endeavor to figure out whether or not that force majeure provisions reference to fire encompasses smoke. I'll, I'll take you back off of David's comment there in, in terms of um, advocating for having a smoke exposure specific provision in your great purchase agreements. Um, one of the things we ran into in 2020 is people were trying to um, rightfully, I think, you know, find a way to amend their current great purchase agreements uh, in order to take into account the fire situation and the backup at the labs. But the problem with doing that on the fly during the middle of harvest is how time crunched wineries and growers are during that time period. So if you have a great purchase agreement that you sign in the spring that lays out a process for all parties to figure out who's responsible for collecting samples, who's responsible for taking it to the lab, our lab results shared, things like that, it allows you to have a playbook so that in those times of emergency, in the middle of harvest, everybody knows what their rights and responsibilities are without having to try to renegotiate that on the fly. Um, so that's um, you know another plug for, for taking a look at your great purchase agreements. I think it's, uh, John, that's an excellent point there is having that playbook. I'm trying to pull Jeff in here. Jeff, as, as a grower entity, how, what would your growers, would you advise the growers within um, AGG to be signing that sort of thing? And, and what sort of items would you guys be willing to sign off on, uh, on a playbook there? That's a great question. So absolutely, I think that there's uh, an incredible amount of importance in having language now included in contracts that deal with this. I, I do think it's dangerous to go forward and just uh, ignore it as if it, it hasn't happened or it's not gonna happen in the future by not having it uh, addressed in the contract. Um, but, you know, to David's point, you got to know your buyer and, and you got to discuss smoke issues. I mean, those are two things that I think are, are kind of coming out of this. And, and what I see now is there are a lot of contracts being issued with smoke exposure language included. Um, some language is fair in terms of our uh, evaluation of that, and some isn't. Um, I would caution uh, the grower community to certainly understand what they're signing when they're signing a contract that's been given to them with smoke exposure language or when they're presented with an amendment to sign uh, for an existing contract. Uh, you have no uh, obligation per se to sign an amendment to an existing contract that you don't agree with. Uh, that's something that, that can be negotiated. Um, and my concern is that some of the uh, language that's coming uh, into these contracts now, of course, it's written uh, by attorneys that are representing uh, the buyer. And so they're going to protect their client in crafting that clause. And that's fully understandable. But what that means is a lot of times it's extremely weighted 
to the benefit of the buyer. And it might say something as extreme as if there's detectable uh, presence of volatile phenols that the buyer can reject. And that's just, that's extreme, right? I mean, that's as extreme as it gets. If we can test it and find it, we can reject your grapes. And so that's something I, I think we need to, to kind of flesh out a little bit more in this conversation. Uh, is that uh, reasonable? It, um, is it something that we are going to see in contracts? Absolutely. I have no doubt in my mind we're going to see that in contracts. Uh, it's not something I think should, that should become industry standard. There's plenty of evidence, anecdotal and otherwise, that suggests that uh, just because you have a measurement, a measured volatile phenol in a in in a wine, it does not, um, you know, make that wine unmarketable, unsound, or unmerchantable. So uh, that that's something that needs to be fleshed out between each grower and buyer in a, in their individual situations. Thank you, Jeff. And I think I think the um, that's a different Everest for us to climb is the detect versus taint. That, that level um, of volatile phenol, I think, is definitely something to flesh out. And there might have to be an entire symposium devoted to that. But in the meantime, uh, Mr. Brian Clements, how, what are you seeing from uh, the Turrentine Wine Brokerage world? Have growers and winers been coming to you with clauses? And how's that going? Yeah, you know, the... Considering all the activity. You know, I, there's nothing better than free legal advice. And, and, and DPF is certainly <laughs> one of the best law firms out there to, uh, to do that. Uh, not free, actually. They charge for it. But... You get what you pay for, it, Brian. Don't, don't I know it, David? Yeah, what you pay for. It. Don't I know it? Um, so, um, but you know, the, it, you know, I've, we've all been in business a long time, and and, and and not to start anything here, but wine grape uh, contracts have always been curious to me because they're written by the customer. You know, cash defines the customer, the winery is the customer, so the, the the customer's writing the contract. I'd love to write a contract when I go buy a car or a house, right? But I don't think anybody's going to want me to do that. So. The, the it's 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 been interesting to me be from from all these years you know the more I think I know about grape contracts the mo the the, uh, the more they become a curiosity to, to me one of the things and and that that I've seen in the last couple of years that is a concern for as, as a traditionalist of myself uh, is that you know back in the day it was really easy because the the winery took you know the the winery took charge of the grapes at the scale it's and I'm sure there's more legal to that but but lately, what I've seen is that that more and more the the responsibility of the grapes go uh, continue to go from the grower into the tank, and I you know those that's one of the things that's a curious it's a curiosity to me because it, it used to be to me a bright line you know in my non legal mind it was a bright line that the, the, it ended at the at the at the at the test stand, but now more and more it seems and we have these conditions whatever conditions we have they they follow the grapes into the winery and I. And I throw that up there to be batted around like a like a you know a bad housefly, but um, it's it just seems that we have these 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 situations that are, are arising that are atypical of what we've seen decades in the past, you know. So I just throw that out there. But but to answer your question, Lise, yeah, you know, a lot of a lot of the questions are is what are other people doing? Because curiosity is everything that's going on in the wine business now. You know, growers are wondering what other growers are doing to to uh, uh, combat this, uh, you know, the, these new uh, clauses and everything. And wineries are asking what other wineries are doing because nobody wants to be overboard. Nobody wants to have that contract that is just, you look at it and go, are you kidding me? I mean, I'm not going to sign this. Nobody else has this. Oh, really? We haven't seen anybody else's contracts. But the one thing to me that I've seen, and in, in, it's, it's uh, in, in my book, it's certainly true. The time for a grower to negotiate a contract is when the market is short. You know, when the market is long, you have to sell your grapes. There's not a lot of there's not a lot of conversations that's going to be able to take place. But when the market's short, you know, growers and and um, and their their uh, their legal advisors should take uh, time to go over the contract to understand it because you know force majeure. You know, we used to call it just boilerplate. It's not boilerplate anymore. I mean, it's it's like like the attorneys are saying, it's very important. So. Um, the time to for a grower to ask a lot of questions is certainly at the time before he signs he or she signs a contract. But again, the most leverage a grower has is when the markets are acutely short, and you know sooner or later we're going to get there. There's a lot of remedies done during that time period. So you know, hopefully, if there's anything out of order in a winery contract, um, um, it'll be done then. But but saying that, you know, wineries have to get the best quality wine they can to the marketplace, and everything is so subjective. The marketplace is very difficult to get your wines there. And the wine writers and everybody, it's, it's a tough market. When you're buying reds, you've got you to guess the market two or three 
years from now on, on what the demand's going to be. So nobody has an easy job here. And, and you know, there's, there's equal stones you can throw at growers and there's equal stones you can throw at wineries. But the main part is what we all say is we all have to try to work together. But again, there's a fine line between greed and panic. And, and the way the markets change, it, it's, it's, hard to walk, it's hard to walk that line. It's, it's, it's a difficult business to be in. I mean, it, it really is. Well, here, I'm going to fly by and, and offer one possible solution that in itself is the Pandora's box of litigation because you'd have to basically rewrite all of your contracts to it. There is much discussion in our beloved industry about getting baselines. So baselines of either guaiacol or 4 methylguaiacol or all seven of the prominent um, volatile phenols um, before we hit a smoke event and understanding that for your site. So if we should have that, um, I presume then we're going to have, it's going to take a little bit of the air out of the balloon on the detect versus taint conversation, I'm sure. But what do you all think about that? If we were able to get baselines, if we had a year where there wasn't a bunch of wildfires and smoke, and we had this good data, how do you see that changing? Does that add in a good solid database with less emotion into the ideal contract going into the future? Well, I think that um, that definitely is going to give us guidance. But ultimately, a contract that is presented by uh, a buyer or winemaker to a grower is going to be something that is written uh, that reflects what that winemaker wants. And that might not necessarily be directly in line with those baselines. And, and you know, an example would be some winemakers take cab at 23 and a half and <clears throat> some winemakers take cab at 28. And so uh, if you're the guy selling cab to the winemaker at 28, you're probably not going to sell it for the same price as the guy buying it at 23 and a half. So ultimately it, it still remains a negotiation point. And I think that, you know, as a, as a grower coming from the grower's side, you just have to understand what the, what the clause means for it, for you. What do the thresholds mean? How much risk did they present in the situation? Uh, I don't, I don't think, although I'm, I'm against uh, the concept of, of rejecting with, de with detection because we are detecting down to a half a part per billion. So I'm generally not in favor of that. Uh, but if somebody presents me with a contract that says that, I'm not going to say take this contract and go away. I'm, gonna, I'm going to inform them that uh, this, that presents a lot of risk for me because the very first time a fire breaks out in the area, that contract just becomes an option to buy. And so what is that risk worth to me as a grower? What more do I need to get for my grapes? What better terms do I need somewhere else to compensate me for that risk? I may have to go buy additional crop insurance that might cost me, uh, you know, it just, it's just gonna cost me be the same way that it costs a, a grower of Cabernet to hang out to 28 instead of 23 and a half. So it's not so much that we define right and wrong, it's that we understand the risk associated with it and we effectively negotiate a contract based on that. Would love for a lawyer to pipe in right now on their thoughts on that. <laughs> I think that Please. what Jeff, uh, Jeff just described is, goes back to what we both said earlier, which is you got to know who you're doing business with. Yeah. If you're doing business with somebody who's, doing a vineyard designate $350 a bottle, uh, you know, Napa cab, they're probably going to want more specificity in that provision. If you're dealing with uh, somebody who's got a whole bunch of brands at different price points and they could filter it, blend it, and it's less risk for them, that's a different negotiation. And, you know, as a litigator, those negotiations take place before I get it, okay? So when I get it, I'm just trying to clean up the mess. I'm assuming that the people involved in negotiating that contract knew what they were doing and agreed to it. What, what I see as a problem is like, let's say this year, there was a smoke tank clause and it said, you know, two parts per billion as recognized by ETS and ETS was so backed up, they couldn't give you a test result for a month. And you had, you know, 48 hours to pick your grapes. Um, those are the type of situations for a litigator that I find to be incredibly um, challenging. And that's where you figure out pretty quickly who you're doing business with. 
you know, whether they're going to be reasonable and you get enter into some sort of risk shifting, um, risk sharing sort of amendment to your existing grape purchase agreement. Yeah, it, hey, John, how do you, how do you contract for that? Well, I was going <laughs> to, Matt, now we're getting into, uh, into the promise area of free legal advice. I can't get quite into that, but I do want to um, chime in a little bit on, you know, the discussion related to knowing the parties to the contract. That not only helps in the upfront negotiation for what comes in, but also what happens when the unexpected occurs, right? So what we saw a lot um, this past year was, you know, the parties that knew each other really well knew what the pressure points, right, were for each of the parties, right? So, you know, if a winer, if a buyer is a custom crush client of another winery and they are going to be paying a lot in terms of processing fees just to bring the grapes in, that's a different animal than dealing with a winery that has their own production facility and the production costs are going to be lower for them. Um, David alluded to, you know, small boutique wineries with a higher price point, single vineyard wine. That's different from somebody who could blend it in or, or maybe has a good, a, good, um, uh, a good outlet to the bulk market. So knowing those things not only helps you with the upfront contract, but also will help you if an emergency arises and you need to make adjustments on the fly because you know where those pressure points are. You know what the adjustments that, um, that those parties are going to be willing to be able to make when, um, when things go, um, go astray. I think it's also important to remember that parties to a contract in California have a, a duty to mitigate their own damages. Okay. So if you're a grower and you're like, no, I'm not going to agree to that. You have a duty to try and sell your grapes on the market. Now it may be impossible for you to do that, but that would be another item that you would need to prove through the use of admissible evidence in a court of law. And it just adds so much expense to these cases. And then you'd have to get an expert witness in there like Brian or Jeff and, you know, get them to testify about whether your efforts to mitigate your damages were actually reasonable. What did you do? You know? Um, so there's, there's such a gray area in the, after the fact post-mortem of these types of disputes that really trying to work something out between the parties is, is paramount litigation over these type of subjective issues. And right now, that's the state of the law on smoke tape. It's very subjective. Uh, is an expensive and time consuming endeavor that should only be undertaken as the last resort. And I'm speaking as a litigation attorney. Well, then considering that, I would really love to see Brian, can you take us home at the end of this session? It still feels very much like we're still climbing up Everest at this point in time. And I'm sure that feels the way for all, all, all of us here today, but also for the industry in general. As you are advising wineries and growers uh, during this pretty, pretty remarkable uh, season compared to where we were last year with regards to the grape market and the bulk wine market, what are your take homes that you just heard just now with regards to trying to avoid the pitfalls of litigation? How are you going to advise your clients here? Well, I just I think that going forward, because we've seen changes that you know, we would have never guessed five, six years ago that were going to happen, you know, COVID, the fires and and all these things. Great legal advice is paramount nowadays. Um, also, to, to like what, what, what David said is, is and, and, and John, know, know your know your customer. Um, you know, we all you know, the know your winery, know the people that are in the winery, know the winemaker, like Jeff mentioned, the subjectivity of the winemaker. Hopefully that winemaker doesn't change go to another winery. We've seen that. We've seen changes, almost domino effect on those sometimes. But understand what's going on in the market, you know, um, and understanding the, the value of the product that you sell, whether it's bulk wine or grapes. There's a there's a couple situations on Napa Cab right now and other uh, varieties that the buyer and seller is so far apart, uh, neither understand the, 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 the market that's in front of them. So knowing the market, knowing the client, knowing the circumstances of, of just the overall circumstances in which you find yourself in when you're negotiating a contract or, or selling something on the bulk wine market. Uh, but, but know this, I mean, we've been through a hellish time here, but the bottom line and taking it home here, the markets are responding in more of a negative way than a positive way that if we didn't have all these things, who knows, you know, who, who, you know just, but, but when I throw the, the chicken bones on the, uh, on the table, um, you know, the market, the, what we've been through is kickstarted a market that would have otherwise 
at least in the coastal regions of California, been kind of dead in the water for both the wineries and the growers. Um, and, you know, sales, you know, going forward, you know, we, we hear things like the next normal or what it's going to be like afterwards. And who really knows if it's going to be like the roaring 20s or it's just people aren't going to go go do things. So, um, you know, 2021 looks promising. Uh, again, we don't need a big crop. The bulk wine market is, is, is limited compared to three years ago. Grape supply across California, especially in the Central Valley, is limited. Uh, we're, you know, Chardonnay and, 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 and Sonoma County. That's that's selling fairly well um, as grapes, and and we're doing resigns. And another thing, Lise, that and I'm, I'm sorry if this is a long-winded uh, closure here, but one of the things that we're seeing different than in 2019 is most of the contracts we're doing. I would say 55% um, of the contracts we're doing right now are multi-year deals spanning out uh, three to four years. So there's a lot of confidence by wineries going forward that they need the fruit that they're contracting, that their sales are either going to stay the same or escalate in the future. So not everything is bad. We've been through the bad and we're looking forward and, and hoping that the, these, these closures uh, go away and people go out and, and enjoy wines and restaurants. Thank you. So um, thank you all so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And we're going to wrap up. Um, and again, um, hopefully we've been able to answer everybody's questions as, we, as we've gone through. Um, and of course, um, again, I can't thank the four of you enough for your time and effort on this incredibly difficult yet important topic. Um, so when we close out, I know we're already over time, but as we close out, I love to do just a very quick uh, coming into this growing season, coming into this litigation year, coming into this contracts writing year, coming into a, a better looking grape and bulk wine market, starting with John, I want all of you to go through one word that how you describe the season. John, go for it. For the 2021 season? Mm-hmm. Resilient. That's scary. Resilient. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Jeff. Rebound. Oh, Resilience. Good. Rebound. Love it. Dave. David. Hopeful. Beautiful. And Brian. No, I was hopeful was my word. So I'll just copy David's word because I've already said oh, it. Good. Yeah. We're very, very hope we're hopeful, David, hopeful, David, resilient David, follow, and rebounding. Great. David. I do a lot of work with David. I, I just follow David no matter where he goes. He seems if like a good guy way. to follow. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I wish all of you and everyone watching then um, a very hopeful, resilient, and rebounding 2021. Take care, everybody, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.